So hi guys, uh, my name is Jacek and as a member of uh, the Meeting Code team, I'd just like to briefly introduce you to the initiative and just say a few quick words about the project. Uh, but first, a very warm welcome uh, from our partners, Hauser Stiftens, TechSoup Europe, SAP and German Federal Ministry of the Interior. And I think we can begin. Welcome to our another Purpose Talk uh, session. Um, and if you're new, uh, just let me tell you a bit about Meeting Code. Because uh, Meeting Code was launched in, in 2017 to simply assist nonprofit organizations in providing uh, digital skills education to young people aged from eight to 24 years old across Europe. And now, five years on, uh, Meeting Code has reached more than 175 uh, young people across 35 European countries. So that's a lot, and I'm super proud of that. And giving them the digital literacy and coding skills to, let's say, thrive in tomorrow's uh, competitive digital economy. And Meeting Code basically awards micro grants of as much as 500 euros to local nonprofits to facilitate the workshops and classes they deliver. And many in our audience today, uh, I think, may be uh, recipients of those grants. And why have we launched the Purpose Talks? Because that's also important. Uh, the, the Purpose Talk series is just an extension of the Meeting Code commitment to help nonprofits become more in innovative and creative uh, in the work they do. Uh, they are basically designed to inspire all of you guys, our Meeting Code community, with um, different learnings and insights from uh, our leaders in the exciting world of IT and coding, I'd say. But I think it's uh, the highest time to introduce our uh, dynamic and amazing speaker of the day. Uh, and as I said, we are delighted to have no other than uh, Jens Munich with us today. And Jens is a researcher at SAP. He's also uh, the architect and lead programmer of UC Berkeley's SNAP programming language, uh, for which uh, he has been awarded the US National Technology uh, Leadership Symposium Educational Leadership Award of 2020, uh, together with uh, Brian Harvey. And for those of you who are not fully aware, uh, SNAP is a well-known block-based programming language that allows you to build your own blocks. And simply by stacking together graphical blocks rather than just typing words, uh, your program is always alive, ready to be tried, tested and changed as your ideas evolve. So, uh, but I don't want to give too much away. So coming back to Jens, uh, he also has conducted research under Alan Kay uh, helped develop Scratch for the MIT Media Lab and written enterprise software. He's a fully qualified lawyer in Germany and he has been, been an attorney, corporate counsel, and lecturer for many years uh, before uh, rediscovering his love for programming, let's say. Uh, we are honored, super grateful, and hugely amazed that despite all your commitment, Jens, you found the time to, to be with us today. Uh, as I said, I'm super excited and I think it's highest time to start the session. So Jens, over to you. Thank you, Jacek. Um, and hi, everybody. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I have to say, um, uh, always when I'm kind of giving a talk, I'm, I'm really, really anxious. And just as we were talking before, one of the problems is that these talks are recorded. So I can't give the same talk twice, really, especially since I know some of you who've joined this talk. Um, so um, please bear with me. I'm going to share my screen in a minute. And I'm going to start with something that many of you might have seen me show before, but that's only the beginning. I'm actually going to try um, to show something completely different and new today, and it might not even work. So if it doesn't work, I'm going to ask you to help me debug um, what I'm going to code. So I'm going to share my screen um, and um, start with an overview. Um, and this is the part that you might have seen before. So bear with me. This is a little background on, 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 on Snap. Um, so uh, this is how I usually introduce myself, that I'm Jens Mernick, that I research into interactive visual programming, which is the kind of programming that does not look like what you see on the screen right now. But it's actually something where we spatially arrange things to give them a meaning where uh, there is a, a graphical 
quality to what we do. And so for the past um, really dozen years, I've been asking myself the question, like, how do you write software for kids? How do you make a programming language for kids? And um, basically much of my work has gone into this programming language, Snap, build your own blocks that I'm gonna show you today. So when they once asked Russian playwright Maxim Gorky, um, who wrote children's books, like how do you write books for children? This is what he answered. He said the same as for adults, only better. And that's kind of a guiding question that we sometimes have. Like, how do you, um, it, it basically replaces an unknown by another unknown. Um, how do you write something the same as for adults, only better? And there are really three guiding lights um, and three dimensions that um, my colleagues and I try to um, realize in, in making programming languages. Um, and really one goes back kind of 50, 52 years now. This is Cynthia Solomon started um, together with um, Seymour Papert, Marvin Minsky um, in the 50s, the programming language Logo, which was the first programming language for kids. And Logo had this battle cry, no ceiling. And that's a very important dimension for us. Like we shouldn't dumb down things. We shouldn't make things easier by leaving out the hard things, but we should actually give kids everything that we have as adults and try to come up with a good way to package it, to make it accessible. Um, and so here you already see kind of one of the first playful robots. It's a turtle that you could use to draw things. So no ceiling is really one of the things that inspires us. The second example is, um, you know, the, the mouse with three buttons. Now we're at the 70s at Xerox Palo Alto Research Center. Alan Kay, Adele Goldberg, um, developing a, another programming language specifically for children called Smalltalk. And in doing so, they not only made a programming language for children, but kind of almost accidentally in the process invented not just the GUI, the interface of overlapping windows of the mouse of menus that we use today, but also the predominant um, programming paradigm, object-oriented programming. And the great thing about this way was it was a really alternative way to think about computing. It is a very expressive way and a very live way. Um, and this computer, which they actually custom built just for the system, it was always live. It didn't have any compile link run cycles. You programmed the thing in itself. So this is a guiding light that um, was really inspiring. And of course, the third one is Mitch Resnick, um, Natalie Rusk, um, uh, the, the Scratch team at MIT who have developed this beautiful, brilliant way to program with blocks, kind of really the first visual programming language that actually worked with kids. And um, so now, today, really blocks-based programming is all the rage. It's, it's clear that when you start to program, you start with blocks, and then there are all these questions like, what comes next? What comes after blocks? And um, so what usually what, what people propose is that there must be some kind of progression. Um, something where you start um, as a little kid and then you start with blocks and then maybe as a teenager, um, you have to move on to text-based uh, programming. Here in the state where I live in Baden-Württemberg, that's about ninth, 10th grade. Um, and then of course, it's clear that adults need to program in a way that at least has curly braces and semicolons and kind of dot notation. And that's the way that is it is really programming, this, this ascension, this progression is taught today in most schools. And the part that has always dissatisfied me is that when you look at these scripts, there really is no progression in meaning, in expression. All these program snippets do the exact same thing. It's just more complicated up here than it is down here. So there is no quality that is added. It's just, just scaffolding for a parser for a compiler. And so the alternative way to look at, at things is, has been really the battle cry by my friend and colleague, um, Brian Harvey, who said, in a programming language, things that matter to a programming language 
should be first class. First class, that's another one of these metaphors um, that is a little bit problematic, as many metaphors are problematic. It doesn't mean that you have to buy the expensive tickets for the airplane uh, or the train, but it means that something is uh, can be assigned can, to a variable. Something can be the input to a function, can be the output of a function. Then it is first class in a programming language. So usually the things that are first class in programming languages are numbers, for instance, or strings. Um, and so the interesting thing is that when, when Brian says, if it's important to the programming language, it should be first class in the programming language is, if you think about functions, if you think about control structures, um, these are very important when you learn a programming language, but in many programming language, you can't assign a keyword to a variable. You can't assign a control structure. You can't pass that into a function. And so this is an alternative way of, of thinking about a single principle that when, we're, when we apply it consistently, will maybe um, come up with a different pedagogy. And this is what we're trying with SNAP, really. So SNAP, um, we've made SNAP for a new course. Uh, it's not that new anymore at uh, UC Berkeley. Um, it replaces the previous course that was called Introduction to Symbolic Programming. Now it is called The Beauty and Joy of Computing. Uh, we got some NSF grants, and it's a course that is used throughout high schools in the U.S., uh, also some MOOCs and edX and at SAP. And what... Um, Snap really is. It runs in the browser. By the way, um, what I'm showing you right here is is made in Snap. Uh, uh, I'm basically using Snap for everything nowadays. Um, it's been translated in a lot of languages. It's free and open source. You can fork it. There's no secret there. Um, but internally, and this is where it gets interesting. This is what I want to show you today. We say it is Scheme disguised to Scratch. So from Scratch, we take these things that make Scratch great. The blocks, they look pretty much exactly like Scratch. We take the 2D cartoon micro world that makes it easy to, to have a variety of projects. Um, Scratch also has some pretty far out and pretty um, uh, cool concepts like parallelism, something that is not really found in, in many other beginners programming languages. And it has the liveness that you can actually um, click on anything and it happens right away. You don't have to compile it first, then get some cryptic error messages and make sense of them. And this is kind of the what we call, there's a low floor dimension to introductory programming. Um, but see, there's this other side when we say from scheme, we take the computer science stuff, we take the custom blocks, we take uh, variables with uh, lexical scope, dynamic types, so kind of heterogeneous data structures. We take things as first class lists, so we can have lists of lists, which allows us to model any data structure. But we also have this, this kind of funny thing called Lambda. Lambda, which lets us make any control structure. Um, so Lambda, kind of, I don't know if you if you see me in, the, in this little window, this is, um, kind of our mascot, it's called Alonzo. Of course, it looks exactly like the Scratch mascot that's called Gobo. Uh, and Brian uh, drew some hair, and that hair is uh, a lambda, a Greek lambda letter. So this is really kind of what, what Snap is. It is Scratch plus lambda. And I'll show you in a minute what that means. Um, um, and so, so this is this other dimension that we, we don't want to have any ceiling. We want there, the sky to be the limit in what we can express in the programming language. And then there's a bunch of other programming languages that we're cannibalizing for things that are important to us. Of course, there's much taken from Logo. There's much taken from Smalltalk, also from, from APL. So we want to have a wide variety of interesting applications, of interesting projects that we can use Snap for. And this is this dimension that we're calling wide walls. So it's a low floor, no ceiling, wide walls. Usually kind of when you have these, when you have three of these um, things, you get to pick two and you got to compromise on one. And um, 
up to you, you be the judge. I'm gonna show you now some things and afterwards we can think about whether it satisfies all of these three dimensions. Um, so this is, um, this is Snap, this is um, how it looks. Um, some of you might know it, um, some of you might not. It's, it's basically kind of looks, if you've seen Scratch, it looks pretty much exactly the same and that's the idea. So people feel at home in Snap. Um, here's something that we call the stage. On the stage, there is something we call a sprite. Um, that's kind of like an error thing. Um, here is an area where we can stick these blocks together. We find these blocks at the left. There's a category, a motion category, and we click on something, it immediately happens. If I click on this move block, it, it moves. Um, if I click on the turn block, it turns. I can move again. I can um, kind of move it back to the center. Things immediately start to happen. Uh, we have other categories. We can change the looks. We've got sound, pen. We got control category. Here are events where we can attach scripts to to uh, like a mouse click um, or a key key event. Uh, we've got some loops here. We can sense things. We have operators. These are these and, and round blocks that can be inputs to other blocks. What's special about Snap is that we can build our own blocks. And it's also called Snap Build Your Own Blocks. In fact, it used to be called Build Your Own Blocks, BYOB, before we had to rename it to Snap because um, some teachers and I guess some parents didn't understand the joke. Um, so we can make our own block. And so I'm going to make a new block. And for example, in Snap, we also can make reporter blocks. That Those are expressions, functions that return value. So I can say, I want to get the... Um, squared version of a number, so I can give it a name, I can click on it, and I can click on num to make it an input. I could even say it should be a number, so it kind of gets a different um, uh, uh, way how it looks. So here now is our squared block, it doesn't yet do anything. Um, this is an input on the outside is a slot where I can type in something. And on the, on the inside, it becomes a variable. So now I can define it and to square something, I can just um, multiply the input by itself. This would be a very simple function. So now I can click on this and I get five squared, that's 25. I can um, try this, I get the numbers from one to 10. And in Snap, we can easily map, you know, uh, list of numbers over a function. So, so now I get all the squares from the inputs of one to a hundred. We recently last year made it so that um, for really only arithmetic things and many mathematical things, we don't need loops and even higher order functions anymore. Instead, we, can, we extended the domain of these operators to lists, to vectors, and even matrices. So we can directly say, I want to square the numbers from one to 10, and now I'm directly getting all the squares. This is an idea we got from APL. So I said it's also, uh, it also works with matrices. So just gonna make a, a matrix so I can have the numbers from one to 12 and reshape it into a table. So these are the dimensions. It says it's, it's four rows and three columns. So this distributes the numbers from one to 12 over um, a list of lists. And I can take this as an input to my squared block. And now I'm getting um, uh, all the squares of the numbers one to 12 arranged in the same matrix that is an input. So this is really, this is kind of, a way how you can extend the language by making your own blocks, build your own blocks. That's 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 the idea of 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 Snap. Um, so you look at the control category. Something that often comes up is uh, so here we have these loops. Loops are very important. You have to learn about loops. We have the forever loop, repeat loop. We even have a for loop. We don't have a while loop in here. So. How can you have a language that doesn't have a while loop? And the cool thing with this Lambda 
feature that we have is that we can make these things ourselves. We can make any block ourselves. So I can make a while loop. I'm going to see while it's going to have a test and it's going to have an action. Um, so here is my my while loop uh, it needs some inputs and the action should be something like a C shaped block. I can even give it a little um, a little arrow that it looks like a loop. So here now it looks like a loop and the test should be an input. Um, it should be a predicate that I can evaluate to find out whether a condition is met. So I'm also going to make test an input. It should be a Boolean, but I'm going to need to evaluate it several times at every iteration. So it could be a predicate, or I'm going to make it an unevaluated Boolean. Usually inputs are evaluated before the function is called. In this case, I'm getting the unevaluated input so I can, I can unpack it on the inside. So this now is my while block. Let's make a little test, um, little test case. I make a script variable. Um, I'm going to put the pen down. I'm going to say while that variable a is less than say 300, I'm going to increment it. So I'm going to change a by one. Um, I also want that sprite here, that, that error to move a step. So it's going to keep moving longer and longer. And so it doesn't fall off the stage and we'll make it turn 121 degrees. Now, if I click on this, nothing happens because I haven't defined while yet. So let's define while. Here's my test. That's the A is less than 300 block. So if I want to find out, if I um, want to find out whether that is true, I need to call it. I need to call test and I can say if, if that test is met, I want to run the action. And now this is something provocative because the action is this stack of blocks. So we have blocks, a stack of block as an input to this function. And this is exactly what I was referring to when I was saying we have first class uh, procedures in SNAP. So I'm running the action. So now this is the first time that we've done something. So how can I do it until the condition is no longer met? I already know what to do. I can just take the while block and just copy this again. Do we get while I'm calling the test, um, run the action, it goes into this slot and the action goes into here. So you see, this is really another provocative way to look at things. We're defining a control structure recursively. Um, and this is, this is kind of this no ceiling way that I've been talking about. Let's actually try this now. I'm, I'm, I'm applying this and let's try this. So we've just made ourselves a control structure that is present in really all professional programming languages that for some quirky design reason isn't present in Snap, but we can make it ourselves and it's not even hard. And so, <laughs> Sometimes people think we just left it out so I can do this example. But the point is that once we have this way to think about programming, to think about control structures that aren't the language, but are just something that you can build yourself, you sort of come into the habit of just writing your own control structures, your own custom things for, you know, any project that you want. So, for example, let me give you an example. I want to make a control structure that makes a grid um, of a cell size. Um, that's a box. I want there to be um, a reference to um, uh, columns um, and to row, and I want an action to happen. So the action is again going to be a C-shaped thing. Now I want the box, that's, that's, that's kind of a size of a, of, a, of a cell. I want that to be a number, a number of pixels really. Um, and so I already have this here. 
this is a grid um and i want columns and rows really to be um outputs maybe i should spell them correctly uh, while i'm at it um so I want this to be an output, it's an upvar, a variable, an internal variable that is visible to the caller. And same thing with row. So you can kind of maybe see where this is going to. This is going to be a kind of like a for loop. Let me actually clear this stage and, and, and reset it. Um, lift the pen. Um, so, Let's say maybe I want to have like a grid of a length of um, each cell should be just 45 pixels wide. So I want to write down something. I want to write join the coordinates, um, join the column and the comma and the row um, at each um, cell. So if I click on this, nothing happens uh, because we haven't defined it yet. So let's define this. Um, in order to define this, um, we need a bunch of variables. Um, so I wanna kind of start at the lower left of, this, of the stage because in snap kind of Y goes up usually in computers y goes down in snap kind of we're like in the the first quadrant so y goes up um so i want to define the origin and um i want this to work with any stage dimensions so i can ask kind of the stage for um its uh, left side um uh, so this is left of stage Incidentally, now this is minus 240. And um, I also want it to be at the bottom of the stage, which kind of minus 180. So um, I want to define the origin for my grid as kind of a point. So I can make a list of two coordinates that has a uh, left of the stage and the bottom of the stage. So what I'm now getting is a list really of two items. So this is my, my, my origin. I want to know, um, I want to initialize actually um, the column to one. Start with the first column and start with the first row. Um, and now I want to find out how many cells kind of fit um, on uh, on my screen, on the stage. So I'm gonna make another um, variable that's gonna uh, be called um, rows. I'm gonna set the rows to, uh, it's really the um, height of the stage. divided by my box. And so I want to add one more so it always kind of passes just one beyond. So it fills the fills the screen actually. Um, these are the rows. I'm going to do the same thing for the columns. Just copy that. That's columns are going to be the width of the stage um, divided by the square box. So now I've initialized all my variables. Now I actually need to do the work. So I need, guess what? The Y loop. So I'm going to have a Y loop and we already made that. So tested it, it should work. So I'm going to say while um, the rows, um, why am I? current row actually is less than the number of rows. I want to increment that row. And likewise, we do the same thing for while for, for the columns, saying while the current column is less than the number of total columns. I also want to increment that.
And then, you know, at the next line, I probably want to reset the um, column again to one. So I'm duplicating this here. And now I want the sprite to actually go to that coordinate. So I'm saying go to a position and a position in Snap can also be a two item list of coordinates. So I already have my origin and remember we can just add vectors. So I can say I want my origin plus a list of my current coordinates, which is the column and the row multiplied by my box. Okay, so this should be the coordinate that I go to. And this is where the sprite is going to run the action. Okay, folks, I've never tried this before. Uh, just basically, um, uh, I thought about this uh, an hour before this talk. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's try this, uh, whether it works. Boy, um, wow, look at this, and it does work. Um, um, okay, so I made one mistake. Um, you know, they're slightly off. So, so we've made a control structure, but um, my origin, I need to, um, I need to subtract half the box from that. Um, so I need to subtract half a box, half the cell, and I could do so because it too is a um, vector. So let's try this again. Um, and I'm getting these um, coordinates now. I've made myself a new control structure and I can, I can change the size of this. Um, so this now works. I can say, okay, what if I um, uh, make it wider? What if I make it 60? Um, I'm getting a different distribution of things. So this is just, might seem a little nerdy, but it's actually a kind of a cool thing that we just habitually get into the habit of writing our own control structures. Now, another really powerful idea of programming is, so we can extend a language, we can make our own language by building our own blocks, even building our own control structures. And this other really great idea is about digitalization. So digitalization is something that I talk a lot about because everybody talks about it a lot. And I, I, I really think it's a, it's a great subject, but what does it even mean to digitalize something? And really it's about numbers, right? So um, it, it really involves taking a signal, sampling a signal and converting it into a number on a range of a lower bound and an upper bound. And it's really something intrinsically humane, right? We have 10 fingers. So no wonder we have a, a, a 10 digit number system. There are also other number systems like um, here's a, a dice. Um, um, dice have been around for a really long time. Um, so this is a six number system, maybe half a dozen. Um, I guess, um, some people um, use that maybe teachers um, uh, in Germany make their grades on a scale of six because they can use dice for it. Um, on the other hand, dice have been around for a long time. You know, it was, I think, 49 um, BC that Caesar crossed the Rubicon and said the die has been cast. And maybe he wasn't so much making a statement about resolve, but a vision about digitalization. So um, actually, let me... Um, import um, some costumes of dice to play with this idea. So this is a dice costume. Um, I'm gonna just rearrange these um, so they're in the right order. One, two, three, four, five, six. 
So here's 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 dice. So now what I can do, I guess, is um, you know instead. So this is a control structure, right? Instead of writing something here, I could do something entirely different. I could say switch to a costume, and let's just take take any random number, um, one to six, because that's we yeah, have, and um, stamp it. Uh, so now I should get, um, yeah, I sh should kind of fill my um, stage with um, dice. So I want to put them closer together, really, really a stack of dice. So I have something that in the sprite that it kind of knows its own width. Um, so this is my width. So what if I take this and try this again? So now they should be closer together, and they are. I still want them to be closer yet. There might be some, so I'm gonna multiply them by 0.7. Ah, and now I'm getting kind of a wall of, of, of random dice, fill my uh, states with random dice, and that's, Kind of a neat thing. It's it's um, some some secondary patterns emerge, and this is where um, I want to try something new. Um, so uh, I have this um, uh, portrait here of our uh, one of our founders from of SAP, and I actually want to import this. So I'm going to make another sprite. I'm going to clear this. Um, so I'm gonna name this sprite here. This is gonna be dice. That's a dice. So we wanna import the picture into this other sprite. Um, this is Hasselblad now. So I'm gonna call this sprite Hassel. Um, I'm gonna go to the center. I'm actually gonna adjust the stage size. Um, so it's just exactly the size of this portrait. And I can make it bigger again. And I'm gonna adjust the transparency a little bit. So I'm gonna change the ghost effect to, so just barely visible, okay? Um, so now I'm switching back to my dice and hey, I have this cool function. So instead of well, switching to a random costume, what if I took this idea of digitalization, of sampling something and turning it into a number and stamping that? So I'm not taking a random costume, but I'm sampling something from here. I can sample something by taking the hue at mouse pointer block. So there's also a brightness at block. And I want the brightness not to be at the mouse pointer, but at myself not myself, Jens, but kind of myself, the dice and the position inside my grid block. So I'm, I'm taking this brightness that is on a scale of zero to a hundred. So I want to convert that into this other scale of the dice of, um, of one to six. So um, I'm trying to um, you know, divide this by 20, then I'm gonna round it and then I'm gonna shift it by one. Um, and then I'm going to stamp it. Um, so what I'm trying to do here is really take digitalization literally, because if you um, look at this uh, dice, so actually the number six has more white space than, um, the number one, so one kind of is more blackish than six. So let's try this. Um, so now I'm filling the stage with dice and they, the number, the dice face is kind of corresponding to the brightness of Hasso at that point. So Hasso is still shining through. I'm gonna make him fully transparent. Um, oh wait, that's the wrong. That's the wrong sprite. Um, Hasso fully transparent. Um, and it's kind of, we can see there's something here, but it's, we can't really find out who he is. So um, maybe maybe the dice is, is uh, just too few of them. We need to increase the resolution. We can do that by 
changing the size. So right now the dies are at 100%, so let's do them by 50 and it should adjust automatically. So now I have increased the number of dice and I'm gonna see what happens. I can actually make this a little faster so you don't have to watch this all along. Um, so this is getting somewhat better. Not good enough yet. Maybe let's have it again. Let's 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 make it twenty percent. So we have many more dice, and um, do one more round. And so, one thing about this digitization is that it sometimes helps to have a lot of data, to have a high resolution. So because what now emerges out of this is a fairly good rendition of Hasso diced, um, where we um, kind of render this photograph in six shades of gray, but it's actually the face of the dice that is not just representing the grayness as a number, but is actually is the grayness. And this is a kind of rendering that um, we're calling dithering. So here, um, instead of Julius Caesar, we now have Hasso Plattner um, and the die have been cast. So how cool would it be to not just do this theoretically, but to actually find out um, whether it works? So what I've done is I've actually bought 5,000 Dice. Um, so here, there's some, some left. Uh, and by the way, if, if, if you think about um, a microgrant um, uh, from uh, meeting code, um, 500 um, euros will pretty much exactly get you 5,000 dice, if you want to try this at home. So apply for a grant for 5,000 dice. So, um, so I bought these dice and um, printed out the whole thing, hustle by numbers. Um, here's Here's kind of this, this, this whole thing. And then um, <laughs> um, this is my son. We kind of had to glue it together and put it into a frame. And uh, the whole family kind of uh, puzzled and took the dice and uh, kind of turned it so it exactly shows the number that is shown. And it was a whole night's work. And at the end, there was only a few left. And um, actually, I'm going to stop sharing now. Um, you can I see myself? No, I, because lo and behold, folks, for the first time, <laughs> uh, this now sees the light of day standing right beside me. Um, here is um, the actual real life rendition of uh, Diced Hasso. And we wanted to find out whether it actually works to take real dice and to, to um, really put them together, whether we would see something, we're actually kind of proud that we do. Um, so um, it's, it's kind of working. Um, just, just wanted to, uh, let me, let me sh share my screen again. Um, uh, so this is um, little movie um, that might be easier. Um, uh, wait, how do I, how do I start it? Uh, so you can see this is up, up close, you basically see the dice. And then as you move away, um, the resolution increases and um, sort of out of these 5,000 pixels, a picture starts to emerge. And this really kind of is um, the essence of digitalization, sampling a signal, converting it into a number on a scale, and then representing it in that number. And then we can reproduce kind of the original uh, picture again. Um, so um, this was actually literally, um, I think the night before the COVID lockdown. Um, so um, we wanted to show this in Waldorf for teachers um, and we were really proud of it. Um, 
And um, then lockdown was, so Hasso was in my living room until my family decided um, we can't have Hasso in the living room anymore. So he's been on permanent exhibit in my basement <laughs> ever since. Um, only to be unveiled today um, for you. Um, so coming back to the question, like how do you make software uh, for kids? So we say the same as for adults, only better, I told you about our three dimensions, kind of low floor, no ceiling, wide walls. And so really the question as we're playing with control structures, as we're playing with data structures, with the linear algebra even, is at one point, why should we have had kids? Why should kids have all the fun? Isn't this also a good way for adults to program? Isn't this a good way for all of us to think about it? Um, programming. And this is something that I'm personally really, really excited about. I think it's it's one thing to um, think about CS for all, meaning how to let every kid learn computer science. But it's also one thing to think about changing CS for all, meaning for everybody of us. Because as, you know, somebody once said, um, professors have only studied and explained history, um, the point really is to change it. Um, and I've since given this talk mainly to Germans, you all know it wasn't Steve Jobs, but uh, Karl Marx. Thank you very much. Oh my God. Uh, Jens, thank you so, so much for that. Uh, I think it was truly a packed session with just lots of inspiring insights. And, you know, as no programmer, I was really shocked seeing you creating all that stuff and making it seem so easy when I bet it's not. <laughs> and the last thing- Of course it is. <laughs> no, it's you not. Know, but the dice piece of art, like that's extraordinary to just do something like that at home. So I, I was amazed. And we are fortunate enough to have Jens with us for a few minutes longer. So I'd like to uh, open up the platform for questions. So just pl please type them into the chat. Anything you, you want to ask Jens, that's an amazing opportunity for you to uh, give all your questions. So feel free. And we have still uh, eight more minutes to, <laughs> to answer some of them. And don't be shy. <laughs> Uh, we have a question, would it be possible to invite Jens to hold a workshop on creating such masterpieces for students? Um, sure. I mean, this is a, the, the really great thing that I can't stress enough is that um, I'm incredibly privileged, incredibly happy to be working at SAP on SNAP. This is something that, um, you know, can't be can't be valued highly enough. It is literally my job to make this. So yes, um, I'm 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 happy to share this. I'm happy to to um, hook up with people um, and to yeah to do workshops. To um, and there's we're offering them also. So come to ours or invite us to yours. Um, maybe at some time even we're allowed to move out of our cubicles again into the real world. Um, dice <laughs> okay we have another question uh this is curious about the biggest program that you ever created with snap how many blogs does it have and what was it for it's a good question i, I really don't know i'm not the one to write these super big projects uh i usually try to um write elegant projects that use uh, less just very little code to do a lot, uh, as you might have seen me do now, or I hide these blocks uh, by building functions around them. The programs that I've seen that really are humongous and are huge are by kids uh, that keep copying blocks and they copy blocks when I say, you know, well, you could you could turn this into a function so you can call it several times. But the humongous projects are mostly kids with incredible energy designing games that are often mind-bogglingly great. And I don't understand how they work. Um, so the biggest 
projects that I've written, actually the one that I just showed you where you can drag these, these, these letters around, that's a pretty big project because that, that took me a pretty big effort. <laughs> Uh, I, I see we, that we have uh, some uh, comments from uh, Mira, your presentation, and Olaf was asking, would you mind sharing the code of the presentation? Uh, in fact, no, let me, um, uh, let me save this right now. And um, I'm gonna say this is, um, wait, can we say this is Dicing Hasso? Okay, I'm gonna say Dicing Hasso. Does that sound like kitchen? I don't know, whatever, so I'm gonna, um, share this right now, um, and I'm, I'm I'm just going to paste it into the chat so you can just 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 use it. Um, uh, I am That's going great. To, uh, let me share this now, and let me publish it. Um, and uh, act. Can I? Can I? Yeah. Here's. Okay, here it is. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, do we have any other questions to the end? Like we have four or five more minutes. So if you want to ask anything, that's the time. Don't hesitate. I think like, meanwhile, uh, I just have a, a question as typical no programmer, but as a person who just, uh, works with people and try to educate uh, uh, young people uh, with coding. Uh, as I saw the pictures of you uh, doing all that stuff with your kids, with your son, uh, what do you think? What is the best option to just get kids and teenagers interested in SNAP and coding and to just show the real value of it? What's your key method? It's a great question. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a really great question. Uh, and, you know, honestly, I don't know. Um, to be honest, my own kids have mostly other interests. Um, and maybe because dad does all the programming. So um, kind of, you know, my oldest son really is an artist. He likes, he, he's actually pretty good. He, he actually likes to draw and to paint. And my, my younger son is a you know, musician and uh, kind of is more into sports. Um, so uh, I really believe that, you know, Programming and computer science is a treasure. It's great. And you sh I think it's, as my friend Brian says, it's your birthright as a human being to be offered um, an insight into it. But not, you know, not everybody has to like it. I think it's okay if, you, if you've seen it, you say, yeah, that's great. But actually, I like to play soccer or I like to, you know, do music. I think that's also... I think that's that's also really great. So um, it's it's something that you can offer to kids. You can try to explore together, and I think that's that's a good way to really explore different things together. And you should explore many things, and not just coding. I mean, you should explore hiking. You should explore you know, riding a bicycle, swimming. I mean, I've heard that many people aren't swimming anymore because of the uh, COVID crisis. So you really should teach yeah. your kids swimming. That might be even <laughs> more important than coding. Um, uh, but, you know, there's one thing that if you try it together, um, uh, if you learn together in a family, if you talk about it, um, this is something great. Don't start too young. Um, when you start too young, it's often the parents um, being ambitious because they work at SAP or at some tech companies. And, you know, this is important. This is what I do. Um, I think it's perfectly okay if they're teenagers because once they're teenagers, they're as we say, they're really natural abstractionists. That's when they're, that's when they're kind of, they want to explore things like this. Yeah, that's true. I think I agree. And uh, I think that we can, uh, last, uh, last, last one question. Uh, what events are possible to join that you mentioned before? Uh, oh, we have, um, we should, should, should um, share this maybe afterwards. Um, so we have virtual events um, like the MOOCs that we do in OpenSAP. There is also a conference, a full-blown conference coming up for just a little fee. It's the SNAP conference, the annual SNAP conference. It's on July 31st on Zoom. It's uh, hosted by UC Berkeley with um, 
people from all over the world. Even in the days before, there is a Young Thinkers Learning Festival um, organized by SAP Young Thinkers, um, which is uh, completely free to attend. Um, that is also around SNAP and around programming and around these things. This is a great event to join. You'll see many researchers, many educators. You'll see us sharing ideas and spreading the beauty and joy of what we do. Um, and then there are other events coming up. Like usually we do another event kind of in, in, in fall. Um, they are right now virtual, which is pretty good actually for people from other countries to join. At one point, I guess they will be in person again, but there's probably going to be a virtual component to it or some hybrid thing to it. Okay, so Jens, if you would be able to just provide me with the links to, uh, to the events, I think that we can post them on media and social media platforms for you to just Absolutely. check it out afterwards. Because um, uh, I think it's super helpful for our uh, today attendees. So I'm just going to paste this one thing here. Uh, okay, everybody sign up. <laughs> now, do <or> now. <laughs> Snapcon.org. <laughs> okay, so I think that uh, we're almost over. So we'd like to thank you, Jens, because uh, that's what that's what's amazing. Like even for for a person not fully interested in coding, it was super interesting. So I'd like to thank you. Uh, I also like to thank our partners and especially you guys, our meeting code audience, uh, just for your time and attention this afternoon. Uh, we've enjoyed hosting you and just I hope that you walk away with a feeling a bit more inspired and motivated uh, to uh, discover SNAP on your own. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in the next Meet and Code Purpose Talk. So just please remember to check our socials to have all the updates. And yeah, just have a good one. Thank you. Thank you uh, again for being here with us. Thank you, Jens. That was amazing. And I hope to see you soon.